Greetings everyone, this is David Adhan and today in this video I'm going to be talking about the 8 Ecumenical Council. For a lot of people this might come as a surprise. I taught Orthodox only believed in 7 Ecumenical Councils this is what usually people think but in fact there is an 8 Ecumenical Council and what that council is is contested by Orthodox and Roman Catholics and in this video I'm going to be giving the Orthodox perspective on what the Eighth Ecumenical Council is, which is the Council of Constantinople in 879. Um, so, as you as you probably know, uh, the Roman Catholics, after the schism, had various different ecumenical councils. What's interesting is that, really, after the schism, their ecumenical council was called by the Pope instead of the Roman Emperor, which was how things usually were. Even the Eighth Ecumenical Council that Roman Catholics accept, which is the Ignatian Synod, which I'm going to be talking about in detail soon in this video was called on by the emperor at the time um, and you know roman catholics have 21 councils orthodox are considered to accept the first seven councils but usually people think that that this therefore means that orthodox just had a dogmatic pa pause after the seventh council and that's just not true in terms of beliefs yes it's the same belief today uh, and back then as well but in terms of kind of the you know, the development of issues and the contests regarding doctrine, etc. Um, orthodoxy still had various different councils after time, right? So, for example, the Hezekiah Synods will be considered to be the ninth ecumenical council by some. Um, in fact, uh, to kind of make, uh, prove my point, the encyclical of the Eastern Patriarchs in 1848 states that the filioque was subjected to anathema as a novelty and augmentation of the creed by the Eighth Ecumenical Council, congregated at Constantinople for the pacification of the Eastern and Western churches. So there are two councils that we're going to be talking about here. There's the Roman Catholic Council of Constantinople, that is, it is accepted by the Roman Catholics, which was held in 869. And this council recognized St. Ignatius as Patriarch of Constantinople, which is why it's called the Ignatian Synod. And we, as Orthodox, accept the uh, 14th Synod in 879 uh, as the 8th Ecumenical Council and it's called the 14th Synod because as you can guess it recognized St. Photius as the Patriarch of Constantinople. So are these councils related and connected to each other? Obviously they are. Uh, it relates to a ecclesial problem that occurred in Constantinople in the 9th century between St. Ignatius and St. Uh, St. Photius. Uh, the Roman Emperor was also you know, part of the controversy at the time. There's a lot of political aspects to it that I'm not going to dive into right now, but this, you know, this part of the slide has information from Wikipedia. Uh, so, you know, just copy paste from Wikipedia just to give you kind of like a basic information on what happened in the Senate. Obviously, I don't believe that Wikipedia is, an, is you know, is going to give you good arguments or anything like that. Just kind of giving you the basic information on what happened in the Ignatian Senate. To kind of give you the context in why this kind of division of ecumenical councils happened. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the things that is noted is that this council was called by Emperor ba Basil. Um, and it was supported by Pope Hadrian. It deposed uh, St. Photius and instated St. Ignatius as Patriarch of Constantinople. It affirmed the 7th Ecumenical Council. Um, and, you know, later on, a 4th Council of Constantinople was called, that was referred to as the Photian Synod where St. Photius was reinstated, um, and it notes the disputes and whether the whether the Pope at the time accepted the Photian Synod or the Ignatian Synod. And I'm going to be making the case uh, based off of Father Jon Dragas' article, um, which is going to be linked in the description below, that in fact even the West at the time accepted the Photian Synod. And, you know, that... The Roman Catholic Church considers considers the Ignatian Council as the Eighth Council for some reason is kind of just arbitrary for that reason. And at that time, the papacy did accept the 14th Synod. We're going to be looking into the evidence on why that is the case. Um, it, it also notes a couple of scholars that, you know, uh, looked into this. So Francis Dornick is the one uh, that argues that the West did indeed accept the 14th Synod. And he is the kind of the up-to-date scholar on this issue. Uh, <clears throat> when it comes to rehabilitating St. Photis. So he's the reason why in Roman Catholic scholarship, St. Photis has been rehabilitated in some way, shape, or form. Um, it notes other people, such as Sesensky. Wikipedia cites 
<clears throat> Shisetsky's book on the filioque. Now, maybe I missed something, but I don't. I haven't really seen a part of the book where he contested Dvornik's claims. In fact, we're going to be citing Shisetsky in this video itself to support our argument. Uh, so even if Shisetsky actually does disagree with Dvornik, um, he doesn't therefore agree with the Roman Catholic point on this view. Um, so again, we're going to be looking into this much more in detail in this video. Uh, this is also a, a Roman Catholic historian, Humbert, Hubert Jedin, kind of giving you the brief rundown of how the Greeks accept, that is the Orthodox accept the uh, Fodian Synod, whereas the Roman Catholics accept the Ignatian Synod. So, uh, to kind of give you an idea of what the Ignatian Synod was about, I'm going to be, we're going to be looking at Canons 4 and 6. I'm not going to be reading Canon 6 because it's long, I don't want to just read things in the video, but Canon 4 of the Ignatian Synod says that we declare that he, that is St. Photius, never was, nor is now, a bishop, nor must those who were consecrated or given advancement by him to any grade of the priesthood remain in that state to which they were promoted. So, I mean, this pretty much is, is a very rigorous canon, and it's not really correct, right? So, um, this canon has not been kind of just accepted, you know, as time went on. Uh, you know, St. Photius was considered to be a bishop. Uh, you know, whoever he consecrated was also, you know, consecrated by his authority, whereas this canon basically says, oh, we don't recognize Photius ever. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the Ignatius Synod was cancelled, you know. <clears throat> but this was this was kind of to give you an idea, again, what happened in the Ignatius Synod and what was at stake. <clears throat> so now let's look at the papal ratification of the Photian Synod. This is from Pope John VIII, who was the Pope at that time, that we had three letters from him, three statements from Pope John VIII, uh, where he says that he annuls the Ignatian Synod and accepts the Photian Synod. Two of these letters were read in the council itself. So in his letter to Empress Basil, Leo, and Alexander, he says, and first of all, receive Photius, the most amazing and most reverend high priest of God, or brother patriarch and co-celebrant, whose co-sharer, co-participant, and inheritor of the communion, which is in the Holy Church of the Romans. Receive the man unpretentiously. No one shall behave pretentiously following the unjust counsels which were made against him. No one, as it seems right to many who behave like a herd of cows, shall use the negative votes of the blessed hierarchs who preceded us. Nicholas, I mean, and Hadrian as an excuse to oppose him. Since they did not prove what had been cunningly concocted against him, everything that was done against him and not, has now ceased and been banished. Here's another letter. This is to St. Photius. As for the synod that was summoned against your reverence, we have annulled here and have completely banished and have ejected it from our archives because of the other cause and because our blessed predecessor, Pope Hadrian, did not subscribe to it. So, some Roman Catholics even go as far as to kind of make a weird argument where they say that, oh, Orthodox who use uh, Pope John VIII to make their argument are in fact accepting papal supremacy because, you know, they're saying that Pope John annulled the council. We're not saying that the council was annulled just because Pope John annulled it. We are saying that the Roman view of that council was cons considered the eight the Ignatian Council to be not accepted. And the East, you know, with their own synod uh, in 879, annulled, you know, the Ignatian Synod. So both East and West <laughs> annulled the Ignatian Council. That's the argument, right? So we don't have to accept papal supremacy to make our point. And Pope John, again, he's just simply saying that, you know, we have annulled the Ignatian Synod. You know, that we have annulled the synod that was against St. Photius. In his Mandatum, chapter 10, uh, we wish that it is declared before the Synod that the Synod which took place against the aforementioned Patriarch Photius at the time of Hadrian, the most holy Pope in Rome, and the Synod in Constantinople, should be ostracized from this present moment and be regarded as annulled and groundless and shall not be co enumerated with any other holy synods. The minutes at this point add, the Holy Synod responded, We have denounced this by our actions and we ejected from the archives and anatomized the so-called Eighth Synod, being united to Photius, or Most Holy Patriarch. We also anatomized those who failed to eject what was written or said against them by the effort by the effort mentioned by our, yourselves, the so-called Eighth Synod. So we have three different letters from Pope John the Eighth 
condemning the council at 869, right? And why is this, again, inf important with regards to the filioque? Well, uh, it's important because as we're going to be seeing, the Horos of the Photian Synod condemns explicitly any additions and subtractions made to the creed, and it condemns the filioque addition. Uh, you can read the you know the rule of the Photian Synod here, um, the or the conciliar statement, right? Or, or you know the encyclical of the Eastern Patriarchs notes that again the Eighth Council condemned the filioque and. If you understand the context and the situation, what was happening at the time, uh, there was a dispute regarding the ecclesial status of Bulgaria. So the Roman, you know, the the, the Roman Church considered Bulgaria to be part of it, part of itself. Um, as you see in history, Bulgaria was uh, accepted to be part of Constantinople, not part of Rome. And so one of the reasons why there was a dispute over Bulgaria is because the, the Latin missionaries were uh, promoting the creed with the filioque. And this is why the East kind of intervened and said, you know, what are you doing, right? This is why late, later after the council, St. Photius writes the Mitsugajo on the Holy Spirit. And even prior to that, uh, the, what led to St. Photius' deposition was that he had a council in which he anathematized um, the Pope at the time for promoting the filioque, right? So this, I believe, happened in 867. And Chesensky notes this as well. And bearing all of these things in mind, it becomes much clearer what was at stake in these councils. And so I'm going to kind of respond to some of the arguments people make in regards to these letters of Pope John. So many Roman Catholics I've heard said that, oh, uh, Pope John was deceived by his legates and he retracted his own letters afterwards. Uh, well, again, let's say that's true. Uh, wasn't St. Photius reinstated and the West accepted, you know, St. Photius died in communion with Rome. I mean, that itself does prove that the West accepted the Photius Synod in some way, shape or form, right? St. Photius died in communion with Rome. Uh, secondly, is that this argument from what I found from my own research, maybe someone in the comment section can enlighten me, maybe I've done bad research, but from what I found, this is mainly a claim made by um, Philip Schaff. So Philip Schaff himself states that Pope John was uh, deceived by his legates. The problem with this argument is that I read the part from Schaff. He doesn't really point out any sources. He just says he was deceived by his own legates. But you know, where is the demonstration for that? He doesn't really cite any source. He doesn't cite any letter or any statements. For all we know, Schaff just heard this from a Roman Catholic scholar and just wrote it like that. You know, that's that's poten that's potentially the case. Uh, and we also need to realize, again, the most up-to-date scholarly work on St. Photius is the work by Francis Duarnik. So the works prior to that consider St. Photius from the, Ro you know, this is from the Roman Catholic perspective, consider St. Photius to be, you know, completely unacceptable, a heretic, etc. Um, and so, you know, when brought when these evidences were brought to enlight, perhaps, you know, it might be possible that these Roman Catholic scholars just tried to find a way to make as make it as if Pope John's ratification or acceptance of the 14th Synod was just an accident or something like that. That is also highly possible. But from what I have seen so far, the arguments that uh, Pope John rejected, uh, you know, his letters is kind of just flimsy. And it also doesn't bear in mind with the history because Pope John was actually killed, um, I believe, in 884 for many different reasons. The main reasons was because he was too close to the Byzantines, that he was pretty much acting against uh, the Carolingian theologians because at the time there was kind of like a Carolingian dominance of Western theology. And, you know, this is what Frankish thesis alludes to, um, where Carolingian and Frankish theologians started to kind of dominate the theological discourse in the West, and they were the ones who were promoting the filioque extensively. Right? And St. Photius' arguments were due to that. And they were uh, arguing for the filioque in a way that was quite different from, you know, the previous, you know, from the past. And this is why you have Pope Leo, for instance, um, writing, you know, the, the shield thing, right? The shield controversy of uh, Pope Leo, where in order to kind of show the Carolingian theologians that he is the boss, he made uh, two shields, you know, one in Greek and one in Latin, 
where the creed was written without the filioque, right? And this happened again just a couple of years ago. And uh, the main point of the Frankish thesis is that the Carolingian theologians were the main pushers of the theology. So there was a kind of like a combat between the papacy and the Carolingian theologians. And Pope John was certainly on the Byzantine side of the issue. He considered the Byzantines to be the ones that were ultimately correct. And he considered to be himself as kind of the ultimate, you can say, leader of the Western church. And he was killed as a result because of this. So if Pope John rejected these letters, then why do we still see historians writing and pointing out that Pope John was killed because of his sympathies to the Byzantine cause, right? It just doesn't make any sense, right? So, so most of the historical and contextual arguments do indeed support that it is it is the case that Pope John did mean what he wrote when he accepted the Fodian Sonat. Again, this is still disputed today. I'm just pointing out that when we look at the facts, it just seems more likely that the Orthodox side is just more correct on this issue. And so we had the rule of the council, you know, rejecting the filioque, uh, you know, stating that if anyone subtract or add to what was said, and again, you know, Roman Catholics might say, this, oh, it's not an addition or a subtraction, it's just a clarification. Well, at the time, the bishops of that council, they didn't think in that manner, right? So you might interpret it in that manner, but the way in which the council fathers of the Eighth Ecumenical Council interpreted this statement, they were pretty much referring to the filioque, they had the filioque in mind, right? So this is not merely a canonical issue, this is also a theological dispute. Um, the emperor's statement kind of uh, is also here. So, you know, the emperor was the one who convened the Ignatian Synod, and then the emperor also then convenes the Fodian Synod and, and, you know, accepts that, yes, this this Ignatian Synod is abrogated. This is, you know, we, we don't accept it anymore. He states, in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, Basil, emperor in Christ, faithful king of the Romans, agreeing in every way with this holy and ecumenical synod in confirmation and sealing of the holy and ecumenical seventh synod, in confirmation and sealing of Photius, the most holy patriarch of Constantinople and spiritual father of mine, and in rejection of all that was written or spoken against him, I have duly signed with my own hand. So, uh, uh, Father Ion Dragas, in fact, notes that the Photius synod was still in pontifical archives and over time, they, they treated it as a pseudo synod, which admits that, you know, even at that standpoint, that there were kind of two competing claims for the eight ecumenical council. So he knows Johann Meyer, the author of a most true study of the Constantinople Council of 879, has pointed out that Roman Catholic canonists first referred to their eight ecumenical council as the Ignatian one in the beginning of the 12th century, in line with Dvornik and others. Meyer also explained that this was done deliberately because those canonists needed at that time Canon 22, which relates to uh, laymen not being able to intervene in clerical matters. I think that's what Canon 22 is about. And at that time, there was kind of like a crisis regarding that. And so Canon 22 was useful for that purpose. In point of fact, however, they over overlooked the fact that this council had been cancelled by another, the 14th Synod of 879, the acts of which were, which were also kept in pontifical archives. And so, Shysensky also comments on this. Uh, he writes in his book on the Filioque, Soon afterward, in 879, the emperor called for another council to meet in Constantinople in the hopes that the new pope, John VIII, will recognize the validity of Photius's claim upon the patriarchate. This council, sometimes called the Eighth Ecumenical Council in the East, was attended by the papal legates and by over 400 bishops, which were way more than the bishops in the Ignatian Council and who immediately confirmed Photius as a rightful patriarch. The acts of the anti photin synods of 863 and 869 were completely rejected and annulled and not to be included or numbered with the holy councils. In the Horus of the Council, the creed without the filioque was read out and the condemnation pronounced against those who imposed on it their own invented phrases and put this forth as a common lesson to the faithful or to those who return, return from some kind of heresy and display the audacity to falsify completely the antiquity of the sacred and venerable rule with illegitimate words or additions or subtractions. Shesensky then notes, this conciliar condemnation of the interpolation played a large role in the later Byzantine polemics and seemed a complete vindication of the position of Photius. 
Johann Meyer, in his study of the council, points out that this condemnation was aimed not so much at Rome itself, but at those Frankish missionaries and theologians who had introduced the teaching among the Bulgarians. Pope John VIII, for his part, gave his qualified assets to the Acts chiefly because, like Leo III before him, he resented Aachen's growing influence on ecclesiastical policy, which he believed was his alone to decide. So, kind of the Frankish thesis that I've noted here. So, after getting into the history, let's talk a little bit about the theology of the Philirca and why it was rejected by the Photian Synod and why St. Photius kind of had the view that he had. Uh, St. Photius is the author of the mystagogy of the Holy Spirit, which includes several theological critiques of the Philirca. So, the fact that he kind of is kind of leader of the council and that the Philirca was rejected kind of itself proves, in my opinion, um, not even in my opinion, just straight up proves that this is not just merely a canonical issue, but it is also a theological issue. So the Eighth Council is not merely a canonical council accepting St. Photius. It is also, for the Orthodox Christians, a synodical rejection of the Filioque in the Eighth Council. And this is why some people I hear say that the Eighth, uh, sorry, that the Filioque did not, was not condemned synodally by the Orthodox. I and mean, that's blatantly false. It was condemned even before the schism. And the view of the Eighth Council is still the view that we hold today. And so for us, the main anti philoque arguments that we use are going to be from St. Photis. This is why even though his reputation at that time was that of a very erudite scholar, his reputation in Orthodox history has become that of St. Photius, the refuter of the heresy of Filioque, pretty much. That's ba basically what his reputation has become, right? Um, <clears throat> Uh, this showcase the same for in moments in the eight. Uh, that's not eight sixty nine. That's eight seventy nine. Uh, that's a typo. Synod is another proof that the Philippic was not a mere canonical issue, but also a theological issue. Uh, let us also not forget that in the before and after of the Council, the Philippic was still heavily debated between East and the Carolingian West, which started to define theological beliefs in place of the papacy. Which even if the papacy, we were to say, if even even if the papacy at the time accepted the Philippic, let's assume that. Um, they still did not desire the Carolingians to be the spokespersons. So that still means that there are two different views, even on the Filioque itself in the in the West at the time. I mean, so much for theological unity. And so let's look at St. Potus's main arguments in his mystagogy. Uh, if she says, he notes that there are mainly six arguments. Number one, if the Father is one source of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the Son another source of the Holy Spirit, the monarch of the Holy Trinity is transformed into a dual divinity. So the Roman Catholic response is usually that the Father and the Son together is one principle. Uh, but then this gets into the third point. Well, what is this principle? What is the base of this principle? Is it the hypostasis of the Father, or is it the divine essence? If it's the hypostasis of the Father, then the Son is sharing in the hypostasis of the Father, which is why one falls into semi sibelianism If the principle here is the essence then why doesn't the Holy Spirit cause itself? If he doesn't cause himself, then the Holy Spirit is outside of the communion of this kind of principle of causing the Holy Spirit, which subordinates the Holy Spirit into a lesser be. Uh, second point, if his, if his, that is the Spirit's procession from the Father is perfect and complete, and it is perfect because he's perfect God from perfect God, then why is there also a procession from the Son? So basically, what's the point? Why does the Son cause the Holy Spirit if the Father can perfectly cause the Holy Spirit by himself? And Roman Catholic response to this is because of relations of origin, right? For the Holy Spirit to be the Holy Spirit, there needs to be uh, differing relations. So, uh, you know, the Son is the Son has a relation with the Father as his origin, and the Holy Spirit has his origin in the Father and the Son. And that's how we can distinguish between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because the, fa the, the Father has no origin, right? Uh, this rejects the idea of hypostatic pro properties in how we distinguish the persons in the Trinity. It also, I will say, rejects the distinction between begetting and proceeding. In, in, in you know, St. Gregory the Theologian and other fathers, like St. John of Damascus, begetting and proceeding are distinct we just don't know the distinction so if the distinction between beginning and proceeding is that begetting involves one origination proceeding involves two origins 
then that should be the distinction, right? But the fathers don't clearly don't view that as the distinction between beginning and proceeding. They say we don't know what the distinction is, but we know that there's a distinction because that's what has been revealed to us. That's the argument that they use. So the fourth point, because the father is the principle and source, not because of the nature of the divinity, but because of the property of his own hypostasis, the son cannot be a principle or source. So being principle or cause um, is, is a hypostatic property. Since it is a hypostatic property, another hypostasis cannot share in it. If he shares in it, then it gets to the third argument, which again falls into semi sibyllianism by teaching of the procession from the Son, also the Father and the Son end up being closer to each other than the Father and the Spirit, since the Son possesses not only the Father's nature, but also the property of his person. Uh, sixth, the procession of the Spirit from the Son makes the Son a father of the Spirit's being. Thus, it is impossible to see why the Holy Spirit could not be called a grandson. Uh, this argument from St. Photius just is mimicked by St. Gregory the Theologian, in fact, in his, in his Oration 31. He says the the... The, if the Son caused the Holy Spirit, the Son will be a grandson. Um, the, sorry, the Holy Spirit will not be the Holy Spirit. He will be the grandson, right? Um, so that's, a, that's an argument that St. Gregory the Theologian uses. And St. Photos is just repeating that argument. And finally, we have the arguments from Nicetas Byzantinos uh, that are similar. You, you know, it's different in some ways as well. But Nicetas argues... Uh, that uh, that since you know, he says, since our opponents say that the Son is also a sender forth of the Spirit, let us ask them, if the Son is both caused by the Father and a cause of the Spirit, is he sender forth of the Spirit as a cause or sender forth of the Spirit as a caused being? If they say he is sender forth of the Spirit as a cause, then they have posited two causes in the Godhead. And we have already established that this is blasphemy of the worst sort. And this, you know, this is in context of Nicetas Byzantinus' arguments with Muslims. His argument against the Muslims is that there is one God because there is one first principle, and that's the person of the Father. Because so there is one God, the Father. <clears throat> and this is why for Nicetas, this is an unacceptable kind of an argument. Because if we were to accept this kind of a filioquist argument, then we will end up in polytheism. At least two principles of pretty much dietism in this in this way. And he says, and we have already established that this is blasphemy of the worst sort. If they say that he is sender forth of the spirit as a cause being, then they are saying that the spirit is caused by the son, which makes the spirit a grandson. We need not say more. And then he says, the sending forth of the spirit can be a characteristic of only one person. Otherwise, if the son shares with the father the character of sender forth and the characteristic of sending forth, then the father and the son will share a characteristic of sending forth. Uh, will share a characteristic that the Spirit does not have. Unless, of course, you are ready to say that the Spirit too is a sender forth. But see the absurdity of that position. Is the Spirit the sender forth of itself? Or is the Spirit the sender forth of some other person? Which will then render the Trinity in, into a quaternity. And, you know, this goes into ad nauseum. So these are the kind of theological, main theological arguments against the filioque that the fathers of the eight ecumenical councils had. And... The, uh, the conclusion I will state is that at the time in the 9th century, in 879, between the East and West, there was accepted a Eighth Ecumenical Council. This Eighth Ecumenical Council was the Synod of Constantinople in 879. This council re uh, reinstated St. Photos as Patriarch, but more importantly, has rejected any additions or subtractions to the creed as heretical, and those who do this should be anathematized by the Church. And it also rejects, this therefore rejects the filioque. And so in the 9th century, we have already a conciliar rejection of the filioque. But after the schism, the Roman Catholic revisionism of history has accepted the Ignatian Synod, which was annulled by a synod 10 years ago, uh, 10 years after the Ignatian Synod. But they accept the Ignatian Synod for many reasons, one of them, again, in my opinion, is because they don't want to they don't want to reject the filioque, and so I suppose the the main point in this video, I guess, is that the filioque was rejected in the ninth century, both east and west. And this is one of the arguments uh, that I have made in many of the streams in regards to the filioque that, that the filioque, if you read to read into Saint Maximus the Confessor's letter to Marinus, which I have a video on. 
it is clearly stated that the filioque of the Roman, uh, Roman Catholics, as dogmatized in Florence, where the Son becomes a cause, is different because St. Maximus says that they don't believe, that is the Romans, don't believe that the Son is a cause of the Holy Spirit. And so there is an evolution of this belief uh, starting from the Carolingian theologians. And this is why I will argue that the Carolingian theologians really, in a way, subverted and corrupted the Western Church and has evolved it to the way it has become today. And that will conclude my video. So thank you all for watching and thanks to everyone that has been supporting my channel, uh, particularly those who have been supporting my channel in Patreon financially. Uh, thank you to Una, Diet Soul Light, Allison, Eddie, Father Justin, Node, Maximus, Mitch, Jonathan, Stephen, Vlad, Kerry, Ignatius, Mike, Jack, Nectarius, Flood Basement, Dave, Colton, Seraphim, and Norbert. Thank you all for supporting my channel. And I will see all of you in the next video or stream. And the recommended videos, if you have questions regarding the theology of the Filioque or St. Maximus' letter to Marinus or the history of it, uh, more resources on the Filioque will be given in the description below. So thank you for watching and I will see all of you in the next video. Goodbye.